Welcome to Dynamo's Dozen, the podcast that I bring you each and every single week where I talk about whatever may be on my mind from pro wrestling, sports, entertainment, music, newsly, fresh socks and jocks, and everything in between, never forgetting the talk. I am your host, Dean the Dynamo Kelly, and welcome back once again to the man that Dave Meltzer wishes he could be, Mr. Finley Martin. How are you, sir? What an introduction. <laughs> I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Our first appearance this year. It is indeed. And I, I, I thought you would enjoy that, uh, that intro because you kept it short and sweet. Finn, for all you ladies and gentlemen out there, doesn't like big, long, ego-boosting, uh, you know, uh, introductions. However, that's an introduction that we can all agree with. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, well, Finn's not, he knows it too. Well, let's get on with today's show. Uh, I think that guy's doing very well for himself. and doesn't need any comparisons with me. <laughs> He's doing very well for himself for an absolute numpty. So let's keep going. Um, uh, all right. So, Finn, I, I suppose first appearance of the year rather than jumping straight into it. How have you been? Obviously, um, we're still in Groundhog Day pretty much. Yeah. Um, nothing much has changed since we've seen each other last, probably other than our haircuts and probably our <laughs> mental sanity but yeah as far as everything yeah. else goes <laughs> it's all good yeah i'm doing all right I'm, i've had my first dose of the pfizer vaccine so uh you know but i'm 51 so uh even though yeah i know people don't believe that but i am so so no, no. Yeah, i've had my first dose of that and <clears throat> you're here in uh england um we are moving back to normality ever so slowly the big move is april 12th when the pubs can reopen outdoors you're so loving that forward to that that's two weeks today um, so yeah, I'm doing all right. I mean, I really can't complain. There's a lot of people out there who've got a hell of a lot more to complain about than me. I know I've said that before, but it's true. Yeah, no, <clears throat> I, I agree with you. We're still in lockdown here in Ireland, but like, look, it is what it is. We're uh, we're still in bed with the EU. You guys got out, so you can yeah. do whatever the hell you want. Yeah, well, that's yeah. right. That's right. So you know, oh. if, they, if they lift the restrictions a little bit, you might just catch me over in a certain area. I won't mention your uh, your, your neighborhood, but <laughs> you might catch me over there in two weeks for those pubs reopening. That sounds really nice. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I know probably, things. Are, I know things are different over there. I hope things. I hope things going to pick up for you. You know, I'm going to get the vaccine because. Yeah, I mean, I know you're a bit behind the UK, aren't you, on the vaccine rollout? Oh, a bit. <laughs> We're way behind. We're way behind. It's, uh, you know, without getting too political, there's lots of kind of political problems in Ireland at the moment that certain government officials are getting preference on vaccines and certain family really? members and stuff like that. Yeah, private school teachers are getting vaccines ahead of frontline workers and stuff. So it's, yeah, really? it's pretty, it's going to get pretty nasty over here, unfortunately. But, uh, is it? But look, we have pro wrestling to talk about, and that's really, that's why people are tuning in here to keep their mind off the uh, the real life mundane uh, that's escapist entertainment. That's what we're here for. Exactly, and we are here for. So we said that we, you know, our, our kind of uh, our quarterly quarterly catch up. I suppose we we uh, we have a good bit of stuff to talk about, and we're kind of in the run up now to WrestleMania too, which is pretty cool. But we will get to that later. Yeah, you kind of wanted to talk a little bit about. Um, the Hall of Fame induction, yes. first of all, because obviously it's, 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 I suppose it's always the exciting part, who goes in, who isn't going in, um, and then people can debate who's been left out again, and people can yeah. argue over who is in. So uh, why, don't, why don't you take the lead on this one, Finn? Well, I mean, great to see Davey Boy Smith going in at long last. Yes. I mean... Dynamite Kid's not in yet, as far as I know. No, no. Um, which is curious. To, I mean, Davey absolutely deserves it. Lots of people say, well, Dynamite Kid should have gone in first. And yeah, he was established. He entered the business before Davey did and was obviously a legend in Japan. But for me, Davey Boy Smith was a huge part of Superstars Wrestling, the forerunner to Power Slam. Um, I mean, actually called Power Slam Power Slam uh, after his move, his finishing move. Uh, you know, which is my, kind of my tribute to him. And um, and he was the guy who headlined SummerSlam Night 2, which for many years was WWF's biggest drawing event ever in terms of live attendance. Um, and, you know, it was, it was a huge star, obviously, 
in the UK as Big Daddy's tag team partner, went to Calgary, did well for himself in Stampede, went to New Japan, did well to, uh, also there. Uh, then with Dynamite, they went to All Japan, then they ended up in WWF, had a really good four-year run there. And then after, you know, Dynamite essentially retired, Davey had that second career as a singles performer um, and was a you know, huge part of the wrestling craze in this part of the world. Yeah. Um, you know, and did well for himself there, mm-hmm. went to WCW in 93, um, did well for a while there. That was a decent run for him. Uh, then went back to WWF and I thought he did well in 96, 97. Uh, was really over there, certainly as part of the Hart Foundation in 97 after Brett turned heel in the USA. Um, obviously things unraveled really badly for him late 97 onwards. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, in terms of in-ring career, absolutely deserving. I'm sure you agree him. Oh, how, how could I not agree with, with some of the people that have been, you know, inducted into the Hall of Fame in the past? Like, I, I couldn't disagree with that. I mean, for me personally, I would have loved to see um, the British Bulldogs going in as um, as a tag team. And I both think that they deserve their individual inductions as well, personally. Yeah. Um, I think there's no doubt about that. Everyone knows. <laughs> Everyone that knows me and, and Finn, you know me better than most. I'm a, I'm a major uh, Mark the Dynamite kid in particular, so. Um, I'll always fight his corner, um, but I mean, I don't think there's any argument that David Boyd Smith deserves to be uh, to be in there. And um, obviously, with the passing of Dynamite a while back, I think it's only a matter. Of, it's got to be only a matter of time before Dynamite goes in there. You know, um, you would think so. Yeah, I think they, they can't they talk. Said, they can't keep using this old Dynamite kid with his track record of of uh, you know this and that. You know, we don't we don't want to cause a stir when you've got guys like Scott Hall that are in it you know hall of fame on multiple multiple occasions so um, yeah yeah i mean i'm sure they'll get around to it at some point yeah i think yeah. He, de- he died was it december 18 i think it december was december 18 yeah yeah it was, it was december 18 so two years ago rest in peace don't we um, yeah and and of course davy and it's it's kind of sad when you think about it because i still think pound for pound they're probably the best tag team in terms of innovation you know we always get rock and roll express and you know uh, the rockers and stuff like that i think that 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 feud that they had with the heart foundation in terms of wwe wrestling was was the best tag team feud pretty much of all time and i think <clears throat> realistically i think when you look at what a lot of people that say that you know talk about the rock and roll express and whatnot for and they're amazing listen they're one of my favorite tag teams but i think when you look at what the british bulldogs doing in japan even good lord yeah. good lord how good were they yeah I mean, Rock and Roll Express, it was a different style, wasn't it? But it was absolutely appropriate and compatible with their audience. Oh, yeah. You know, and that's the difference, is there? I mean, I'm not sure whether Ricky and Robert could have got over in Japan, whether their style would have translated as well as the... I don't think so, because it was all it was all based on heat and based on, you know, like, you know, Ricky is is probably one of the best... um, one of the best sellers of all time and one of the best sympathy gainers. I'm sure you would agree with that. Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. You know, when we look at Hogan reaching for the crowd, like literally Ricky could just put a hand out and people would be crying in the front row, you know, to help him. So um, I'd agree. But no, you're hundred percent right. Davy Boy Smith Definitely. is Definitely. without a shadow of who's inducting Davy Boy? Is it gonna be his son or his wife? Uh I thought wasn't it wasn't it George or his daughter, but I'm not I'm not sure. George is going to be the yeah. Well, she's been on a big campaign, isn't she, over in the UK, yeah. and keeping his memory alive. So that's. I was just wondering because I know Harry obviously was in the WWE before. I don't know whether that relationship had been mended or whatnot. So. Um, yeah, I mean he's I mean he's somebody who I think really should you know if they can work it out he's somebody who really should be back there and I think could too. do well again. Maybe the um, two of them, the two of them, there's two kids. There's no harm in both. You know what I mean. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. You would think both will be up there, um, and and it would be, I think it would be a good a good sort of way of reintroducing um, Davy's son as a wrestler because I me mean, he had a very disappointing run back in the two thousands, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if he was quite ready for it, and I think there was a few bumps in the road there as well. Um, but I think now older and wiser. Uh, hopefully he's somebody who could do well in that system. But, I think so. I mean, he's a, he's a big guy. He, he can definitely work and he's got a good kind of background. And I mean, I'm sure they were probably going to do the usual go-to Brett induction. Do you know what I mean? But I don't think that that would work on, on this occasion. I think that, 
I think we know enough about, you know, Davy's voice and his kids that they should probably have that spotlight on this particular occasion. But um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Uh, we understand Rob Van Dam's going in as well. That's yes. just been announced. Yeah. So what do you think about that? Well, listen, I, I was never, you know, I was never like like Jeff Hardy and all these kind of, um, I suppose, 2000 guys that came in. I mean, I know Rob Van Dam was obviously around in the uh, in the late 90s as well. But, you know, and, and you know, I've seen a lot of his ECW and stuff. I wasn't a big fan of ECW personally. Um, I know that rubs a lot of people the wrong way. I don't know why, because I didn't realize that you have to like ECW to be a wrestling fan. But uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit like now, isn't it? You have to like AEW, right? If you don't think Kenny Omega is the best wrestler in the world, then you're not a wrestling fan. I'm like, no, no, you're not the wrestling fan because you think Kenny Omega is the best wrestler in the world. So, boy, boy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think uh, uh, RVD absolutely deserves that. You know what I mean? You couldn't argue that because, I mean, I think when he came into WWE, he was a very fun character. Um, he's done his time in the ring. Um, it, you know, very much so an innovator and brought a lot of, like Jeff Hardy. And, you know, you can probably see the comparison I'm going with there, that there were sure. two people that brought a lot of different uh, different fans in. You know what I mean? Like yeah, the skateboarders yeah, yeah. and the, the kind of, the weed smokers, <laughs> the uh, 420 like, brigade. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I think no, I think it's I think it's a great idea to bring RVD in, especially while he's still young and kind of have and kind of have a good speech. And you know, I think it's I think it's a nice uh, I think it's a nice touch. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I agree. I mean, he's he's somebody that you know. The first time I saw him, I think was as Robbie V in WCW, which would have been maybe 93, 92, 93. Yeah, he's been around a long time, hasn't he, when you think about yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. And um, I mean, he's a huge part of ECW. I was a fan of ECW, but I understand why people weren't. I absolutely... Oh, I liked some that. of it. I liked some yeah. of it. I just wasn't a massive fan of the... I suppose I was a fan of the undercard, very yeah. much like WCW. I was a fan of like the, the Malenko's and Guerrero matches. I was a fan yeah. of the Benoit, Sabu matches. I was a big Sabu fan, which is funny because a lot of people don't think that. But I've seen Sabu working in certain matches and the guy could work when he needed to, but he, he made a niche for himself, you know? So he, he, Well, he did do, yeah. He's, I mean, I mean, RVD was a big star there. He did very well. I mean, I'm personally... He, I think he, I think I did about four interviews with him, and he always had a lot of time <clears throat> yeah. for Power Slam, and so I'll always be grateful to him for that. And I always That's felt cool. he was as candid as he could have been. You know, when yeah. you're doing an interview with someone, he's a straight he, shooter, isn't he? Yeah, that's right. But there are times, of course, when there's some things that they're going to withhold, and 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 you understand why they do that at times because they have to for their own for their own reasons, which don't, they don't need to explain to you. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And to just preserve certain things for employability uh, purposes in the future. And I absolutely get that. But he was somebody who, who was, I think, you know, a really bright guy, um, had a lot to offer the business. Um, one thing that I always really respected him for was that he really stuck to his guns in WWE. And there were certain things he wouldn't do. Yeah. And he was told that, you know, in order to get on and be that top guy, you know, you've got to buddy up to Vince and you've got to do this and you've got to do that. And you've basically got to give up your life and tell them and, or make it known to people in positions of power that you are willing to work seven days a week and give up your entire life for this company. You know, and if you do that, then they will reciprocate. And like, I mean, he's like, well, you know, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing any more than I already am. Yeah. It's up to you to make me a star. <clears throat> but why should I, you know, why should I start sucking up to people to get ahead? You know, I'm an experienced performer. I know what I can do. You know what I can do. So why do I have to do all this other politicking? Politicking, uh, yeah. Politicking even, politicking even. Uh, why do I, I have wasn't to do correcting that? you there? I was actually saying it as you said it, so my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did correct me, and thank you for doing that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, for me, RVD was a guy who just thought, you know what, I'm I'm happy with the position that I've reached in this company, because um, he was famous, wasn't he, for his little backstage feud with Triple H? Oh yeah, and it was like Triple with, H would put him over. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. So Triple H kind of wouldn't put him over. And there was a couple of moments where it seemed like if Triple H had put Rob Van, Dome, Rob Van Damme over, 
he could have gone further. He could have gone to that next plateau, and it never happened. It's that. And we, can I, do you mind if I interrupt you there? It's just funny. Please do. We, we done a four pod man the other day. We were looking back on the uh, the uh, the WWE invasion angle, and isn't it crazy? Even and we were talking about Chris Jericho, you know, eventually being the first undisputed champion. Oh, all of a sudden Triple H is coming back, and now Chris Jericho is minding the dog, and yeah, and yeah, doing foot massages and all this. It's crazy when we look at um, <clears throat> Triple H now and he's kind of positioning himself as the savior of wrestling and the nice guy and all this kind of stuff. But when we look back, like, good Lord, how many careers yeah. did Triple H help? Yeah. Let's not say the word ruin. Let's use the word halt. Yeah. Might be yeah, lots word. of people just stalled, didn't they? Yeah. You know, they met him and that was it. There was no... No pro further progress was possible as a result of what he did. No, um, no. And, and that's a Van fact. Damme was, yeah, Van Damme was definitely one of the casualties yeah. of Triple H. Um, but, I mean, he did have a good run there in the invasion. He did. I always remember that, that interaction there with Steve Austin. Austin really put him over. And like, there was that did. famous yeah. promo, promo backstage where he said, the next person who walks through that door, I'm going to challenge to a match. And then Rob Van Damme walked through at the door. And, like, Austin's like, recoiling like oh my god i'm gonna have to face rvd i wasn't expecting but, this know, yeah <laughs> that's it but part of the problem with rob of course when he went to wwf in 2001 was he uh he gained a reputation for injuring people um and he busted a lot of people open i think it was about four or five people in the space of a month like angle i think test um i think austin as well possibly um, and that there was thing was problematic for him. And he had this style where if he wasn't, if it wasn't precision on those kicks, it could be very painful. Yeah. And the problem was if he pulled them and he tried to work that overly <clears> safe <throat> style, he looked terrible. Yes. Um, but he did settle down afterwards. And I think he sort of adjusted things and got into the flow and got into the groove and it worked out. Um, but he was a guy who had a really good run there, did well for himself. I mean, he was in TNA for a while. You know, I don't, I know. And of course he had a run there as well last year when he went in with uh, Katie Forbes, his, his girlfriend. Um, and it was decent. It was kind of mid card. Um, I didn't really like his run from 2010 onwards in TNA. Um, I don't know. I think he, I think he, I think he was committed. I'm not, trying to pin the blame for this on Rob. Rob, I think it was just more the forces at the time, obviously Bischoff and Hogan, and you had a lot of talent there, um, basically itching for spots. And it was just a very difficult time, I think, for TNA and for anyone with talent to really break through mm -hmm. because there was so many, there was so much competition for spots on the card. Yeah. Um, and I think Rob Van, it was a very checkered run for him. I yeah. thought he, um, in a sense, he should have done more. But at the same time, if you look at all the people who were there, was that really feasible that he could have done more than he did? And I think it was so chock-a-block with talent and veterans that it was a very crowded marketplace. Yeah. And it was very difficult for anyone, even someone as talented as Rob Van Damme, to stand out. Yeah, yeah. And how many more have we got on the Hall of Fame list now? Well, I guess, I mean, I don't really want to talk about Greg Carley because I yeah. talked about that last week. That's, that's, that's I mean, what I was going to say. So before before we, what, what we'll do real quick is before we get to the kind of big name that we have, we have so far, um, yeah. which is, of course, Easy e for any of the newcomers yeah. that don't know who Easy is, e is, e is, should I say, we will, uh, we, we will say that. We'll take our first little break and we're going to come back with um, our final huge announcement in terms of uh, I suppose Hall of Fame inductees and probably going to be the main event let's be real in terms of the the, the Hall of Fame unless someone, I would say so. unless something comes out of the you know out of the woodwork in the last minute I can't really see it happening um, and then we will continue on with Stand and Deliver and much much more but we'll take our first break and we'll be right back that's it welcome back to Dynamo's Dozen where we're given our final two. Uh, and these aren't picks. These are final two facts to be in the Hall of Fame. Of course, Kane is going in. 
which Finn has uh, talked about on last week's podcast, of course. Um, not with ourselves. Where can they find you, Finn? Oh, that's it, the Power Sound podcast uh, for Inside the Ropes. I talked about it there. Yeah. So uh, obviously not with you, Ian. I don't know. That's <laughs> fine. just mentioned where I talked about it. I even, we even got a mention in of, the Christ- of, of his uh, Sterling run as the Christmas creature in Memphis. There you go. And in fairness, Dr. Isaac Yankum, my favourite, of course, 1994, uh, when I was legitimately terrified for my Calgarian hero at the time, thinking, who's this big guy going to absolutely crucify my man? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, but uh, yeah. I mean, it's got to be The Undertaker inducting him, we would hope. Um, I think yeah. the only thing that could derail that is, you know, maybe a $10 million offer for a one night only appearance in some sort of bar from Tony Khan, who knows? But uh, <laughs> I, I think WWE's probably got Mark Calloway under contract. I yeah. think, in fact, as I understand it, he signed a really long contract with them. So I, oh, think, yeah. we, I think he's safe. I think I think uh, Calloway will be there at the whole thing. I think so we're all on, safe. They're on Zoom. Yes. I think we're all That's safe it. that one. Um, it, but yeah. then, of course, this is the big one. Um, Eric Bischoff, of course, is going into the Hall of Fame, um, which, without a doubt, is justified. Whether people like the guy or they don't like the guy, you're talking about the man that beat the WWE for 83 weeks, had them on their back, and uh, obviously came in then in a performer's role as the GM of Raw as well in the 2000s, and done, yeah. I think I think, a great job as well. Um, consummate yeah. professional. Uh, mended a lot of bridges with a lot of people that he had fallen out with and quite liked as a guy now we do know that easy e also has a bad memory especially on his podcast you know he, 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 <laughs> i don't it, recall that's his favorite line that's, isn't it that's his favorite one uh, uh, the yeah. best one i ever heard though was when uh when he was told that he used brett wrong it's like i didn't use brett wrong brett didn't care about it you know wrestling when he came to us blah 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 and i think conrad thompson <laughs> said you know, I just watched Bash at the Beach, Bash at the Beach, nineteen ninety eight, and I watched Brett and Booker T. You're telling me that Brett didn't? That wasn't one of Brett's matches, and putting young Booker T over and giving him like a really solid match. And Vince, or sorry, Eric, kind of comes in and goes, "Yeah, I kind of feel shitty. I kind of fucked up, didn't I?" <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of liked that because he kind of went, "Yeah, I looked at that match and I was like." Yeah, Brett was still really good, wasn't he? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, you know, Brett and, Brett and WCW did have his moments. I remember that Booker T match. Um, it was a great match. Was, great match. Yeah, there was the famous Benoit match from the Mayhem pay-per-view, wasn't there, in November of 99? 99. And then the stuff with DDP in 98 as well, which with yeah. the series that he had for the uh, the, the United States Championship with, with DDP was very, yeah. very good. Done a lot to get DDP over as well at that time. Um yeah, absolutely. I mean, Brett did have his moments. I don't want to get into a, a debate no. on whether or not, you know, Brett, whether or not Brett wasn't, how many cylinders Brett was firing on when he went into WCW. Uh, because, because we'll it, be here all day. Uh, yeah, because at the end of the day, it would probably be still firing on most cylinders that anyone else had to give. Do you know what I mean? So, like, yeah. even a 70% Brett is still going to be better than the giant, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, you look back on it and it's, it was very much like what I was talking about earlier about Rob Van Dam in TNA in 2010, is that you've just got, if you go from Brett in WWF in 1997, yeah. you know, he's number one. Okay, there's Undertaker, but Brett's still number one. The, the biggest show. mistake in wrestling history, isn't it? Yeah, it's the biggest, it's the biggest missed opportunity. And unfortunately, that falls on Eric Bischoff. Well, I mean, in some ways, yeah, what I'm saying is that if you're going into a promotion, right, Mm. where there's, I don't know how many true main eventers there were in WCW at that time, but there was a lot, or a lot of people who could. Too many. Conceivably main event. There was a lot of people. Too many, yeah. We know know politically it was a toxic environment. There was a lot of people doing things for their own self-preservation and their own betterment that were at the expense of others that's pro wrestling it's the way it's always been but brett went into wcw the new guy and it's just like right okay you know wwf works because you've been there since 84 now you're going into wcw which is a different environment with a different crew a different setup a different audience and okay they're going to know you are but you're going to have to do things slightly differently and you're going to have to try and make your way through this 
you know, political minefield. And I don't think he did that. And you can say, well, it's all Bischoff's fault. Uh, and yeah, Bischoff should have had a much better plan than the one that he had. I mean, his debut at Starcade '97 was a disaster. Yeah, I think you that's know. I think that's the big one. And and don't forget, I'm wearing a T-shirt as you know that is the T-shirt that Brett wore for the first few months when he went in, which right. is the Hulk Hogan T-shirt. Hogan was the biggest problem there, really. You know yeah. that 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 heat that goes back with with Hogan and Brett seemed to be. For some reason, Hogan thought Brett was a midget and thought lots of other people were midgets. And it's kind of yeah. like you're, you're, you're kind of going, what the hell that he wanted? You know, so I don't think it's all. Of, but listen, I'm, it, I mean, yeah, there was, there was lingering heat. I just also want to acknowledge as well yep. that Brett's first match, I believe, was it sold out against Flair. And that was a really good match. It was a great match. And the program building up to that was really cool as well, where uh, Flair was like, I want to hear you say that line that you like to say. You know the one, the best there, what? <laughs> and you could see Brett just going, best, yeah. his best it was. And you could actually see Brett sometimes laugh and going, like, this is just this is just great. Like, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And, you know, there was some great stuff in that first year. I mean, he had a great match at Uncensored in 1998, which I purchased through the uh, Power Slam podcast. Uh, well, not through the podcast at that time, but the magazine. <laughs> <laughs> like, Finn, yeah. you've, been, you've been doing podcasts in 94, <laughs> since 98. Yeah. No, I uh, uh, I got I got most of my WCW stuff through that, um, which was right. a cool little uh, throwback on your personal page today to see some of that old stuff. I loved all that. That's right, yeah, th those old uh, WCW the, videos. Loved yeah. it, dude. I have some of them somewhere in storage that my dad has somewhere, and I, you know what? I would I would just cherish to have them. I would never sell them, I, like yourself. I'm sure I, it's just something you gotta keep. Yeah. Although well, you that's... probably would, would you? <laughs> well, uh, I'll make you an offer after the show. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't have a video recorder anymore. I've only kept a few of them. I actually had a bit of an audit this week of my own videotapes and threw a load away Dude, in the I'm hard plastic lunatic. section of the tip. I am you know, a lunatic like, for collecting. I'm a lunatic for collecting. Oh, well. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, lunatic. it's... You know, get, um, it, probably too but many bumps. Yeah, Brett. <laughs> too many bumps. Probably. Oh, but let's not stay too much. Brett, yeah, I mean... You know, so... Yeah, you did all right, Doug. So he did all right in WCW, some of, the, some of the stuff there, but it was like, you know, to me, it, there was a lot of factors working against him. And yeah. I really feel like that double cross, he was wounded by that. He was wounded. Yes. No one can say it to me. No one can tell me that he wasn't. And when he went in there, he kind of needed rebuilding, I think, emotionally after that. Anyway, let's get back to Eric Bischoff. And so Eric Bischoff, no, no, that's a good point. That's a good point that you made there, though, to be fair. And that, that that's maybe a good, like, let's take Brett out of the equation now. A performer comes in and needs wielding. So essentially what that needs is man management. And your top guy yeah. surely is going to be that guy because that's what Vince was. And that's the yeah. little differences. Actually, not little differences. The big differences with Vince and the crowd that Vince had around him. So he had your Bruce Pritchards. He had your, your you know, uh, obviously Pat Patterson. Pat Patterson. Exactly. Yeah. And even at that time, Jim Cornette, these guys could yeah. blow smoke up your arse to fucking beat the band and get you back on top feeling that you're the guy. You know, it's like a footballer yeah. or a hockey player or a basketball player that just needs that little bit of motivation. And like yeah. you say, you go into a, a cesspit like WCW and it's just Eric Bischoff sitting in the back drinking beers with Hogan and <laughs> you know, yeah. all. I mean, Hogan gets a lot of shit and I don't think, listen, I don't think, I don't think Hall and Nash get nearly as much shit as they should um, for, for the WCW era. I mean, those guys are toxic. Why do you think even after WCW folded, they were given chance after chance to come back and Nash didn't even have the excuse of having drug or alcohol problems you know what i mean no. and he was also best friends with hunter so yeah. it's um yeah. you know hogan's the easy target i think in a lot of this and eric bischoff you were 100 percent correct is the easiest of targets yes. but let's look at what eric did um, yes let's look at what he did so he started very humbly in you know done some stuff you know awa and then he ended up in wcw in I think I first became aware of him. I think he came in in 92 and he was yeah. uh, like a C team announcer. Yeah. yeah. Then he had the big promotion after Watts resigned in Feb 93. Jim Ross also, I think, was sacked at the same time. Huge promotion then. Um, so he was like basically running the TV 
Um, and he was a guy who was responsible for most of the big TV related decisions. Uh, 94, he persuades Hogan to come in. I mean, that was the big one, of course. I mean, they had to offer Hogan the greatest deal that any wrestler had ever signed up until that point in history to yeah. get him. Yeah. But Bischoff was aware of Hogan's value. Uh, it was only a six-month deal at first. Yeah. He signed that. A lot of people thought that at the end of that, Hogan was going to go back to Vince. But instead, he extended the deal. Um, Hogan, being involved, persuaded Savage to come over in late '94. Uh, 95, I think, was the first year that WCW actually made money, although that's disputed by lots of sources. Um, 96, things are really, well, obviously late 95, September 95, we get Nitro. He has that meet, famous meeting with Turner. Yeah. What do you need? What do you, you know, what do you need to do to compete with Vince McMahon's World Wrestling Federation? Two hour, one hour Monday nights, TNT head-to-head head with Raw, you've got it. That's apparently how the conversation went. And I would I would believe that, to be fair. Yeah, because, I mean, Ted Turner's got a lot of things to deal with. It's like, you know what? I'm not messing around discussing this. I'm just going to make this happen. Here you go. You've asked for this. Now show me what you've, you know, it's not about talking to talk anymore. It's time to walk the walk. So yeah. we get the one-hour slot on TNT, head-to-head head with Raw on the USA Network, and we have the beginning of the Monday Night War, Nitro versus Raw. So 96, things are moving. Nash and Hall come in for the big deals. Uh, at this point, Vince needs to change. Needs to, he's realized he's going to change his formula and start offering downside guarantees. Now, prior to like 96, I mean, I know Hogan, I think Warrior had some guarantees. And if you go back to, you know, Bruno's days, he had certain guarantees as well. But generally, no one had guarantees prior no. to 96. No, no, no. So, I mean, they, this just changed everything. and had this I'm, giving you a, I'm giving you an opportunity, pal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, during the good times, like, you know, 84, 85, 86, you know, throughout the late 80s, you didn't have to make guarantees because you made more money working for Vince than you, than you did anywhere else, unless you were, like, the Road Warriors or Lex Luger. But actually, Luger probably would have done better in, with Vince in the late 80s than he did with Crockett. But you know what I mean? Sting actually probably made more money with Crockett and WCW than he would have done with Vince. But he was a businessman, though, as well. He was, he was, but I digress. So, I mean, yeah, anyway, getting back to 96. So, you know, with Bischoff making these big offers to Nash and Hall to come over, that then forces Vince's hand to start making downside guarantee offers. And I always think, you know, had Bischoff not had this success, would Vince have changed the formula? He probably would have done eventually, but maybe not then and yeah. really a lot of wrestlers who ended up having guaranteed deals you know should be thankful to bischoff for changing the business or pushing through that change yeah. um and obviously wcw had that tremendous run from 96 through to 98 um when the bischoff hall of fame thing was announced uh, i tweeted to bischoff uh, it took 20 years for them to forgive you for those 83 weeks and I thought, uh, all I can say is it's about time, you know, that you've been finally inducted into the Hall of Fame. Did you, get, mean, a sure. did you get a response to that one? No, I didn't. A lot of people liked it. So, uh, but, you know, hey, ho, maybe I'll in get to interview Bishop one day. I would love to do so. Never. I, did, never I, think, I think you would. I think he's a pretty cool guy now. You know, he just lives on the ranch and he looks like he's enjoying his life. And he looks great, I've got to say. I think he, he looks he great. Does. Sounds great. I've always been, I've always had, you know, I've always just had a, What's the word? I've just always had a thing for Eric Bischoff in the sense that I was always a fan when I watched, because obviously when Brett went from the 90s, yeah. I went. You know what I mean? That's when I went to WCW. And uh, even though like they have some beef in all these days and stuff like that, I'm like, I still always have like a little soft spot for, for Eric Bischoff. And I think, I think it's absolutely well due it's probably overdue i don't think there's anybody that can argue that eric bischoff needs to be in the hall of fame for his contributions yeah. to pro wrestling um well let's move along let's go to stand and deliver this is one of your choices now okay yeah yeah well we've got it's night one april 7th so that's on the usa network so um <clears throat> that's like a week on wednesday and then night two of the april 8th that's on the wwe network or peacock if you've got that so night one on the USA Network, we've got Io Shirai versus Raquel Gonzalez for the NXT Women's Championship. 
feels like this should be Raquel's time. Yeah. You know, she's been, she started, got the big push beginning at the War Games event when she pinned EO at the end of the Women's War Games match. Yeah. Um, she scored that huge win over uh, Rhea Ripley on yeah. the New Year's Evil uh, special back in January. Yeah. Uh, that was a really good match. Feels to me like it's, if Raquel doesn't win the title on that show, when then that's going to be a huge yeah. setback for her. What, what do you think? No, I would agree. Like, if now yeah. is not the time, then when is the time? You know what I mean? I, I think this is perfect time. time. And yeah, no, I would 100% agree with you. Do you think EO can make it on the main roster? That is a good question. Um, like, <clears throat> in terms of, like, where on the main roster? Can she be a body on the main roster? Like, can she be just another girl? Absolutely. Oh, no, what? Like like a star can she okay. be somebody can she get over that's the question that's that's a great question because i look at um <clears throat> i look at everyone now like let's let right in your opinion who's who's the top four female performers on the main roster right now you, you've got to throw sasha banks in there right yeah sasha um, i would say bailey but oh without was, a doubt bailey without a doubt she is just know, her work is just absolutely but solid. she's got she's on the back burner you would think that they're probably going to pit her against bianca yeah. If they decide to make Bianca champ at WrestleMania, which I'm assuming they're going to, of course, after this, yeah. I after think this Bianca, push, they can't fall. I don't know. Like, <clears throat> I look at, I think Sasha Banks this year in particular, without the crowd, has really evolved in terms of her promos, even because I always found that her promos were very stagnant back in the day. Like, I just thought her, and this isn't a knock on the girl. I just thought her literacy in terms of how she was articulating her point sometimes came across like too forced, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, it, felt, whereas, it felt like she was reading lines that have been scripted for her. And yeah. I realise she is, but all actors in films are. Exactly. So we're not supposed to, we're not supposed to think that when someone speaks on yeah. celluloid or TV or whatever. That's exactly It's supposed you. to feel natural, isn't it? It's supposed to just flow. Exactly. Whereas I think now, like, because her entrance was always perfect. You know what I mean? Like, you believe that entrance, right? She believes that she's the boss. She looks like a star. Yes. And her entrance music is awesome. You know, she looks like a star. Now she's backing it up, A, in the ring and on the mic. So I think she's she's come across. I think she's really had a big year. Um, Bianca Belair, I think, is having that problem now where I'm not sure if what she's doing in the ring or the look is quite there on the mic skills. Yeah. From what I've I seen. Think I think, does that make matches sense? Matches are really clunky, really kind of clunky, aren't they? Yeah. Matches? Yeah. yeah. Um, to me, she strikes me as someone who is never really a wrestling fan, but someone who, somebody probably suggested to her, listen, why don't you give wrestling a chance? Because you're a real athlete. You look, you look amazing. You could go far in this world. And she can do some moves well, but to me, she doesn't really know how to put it all together. You know, she doesn't know pieces, how to work yet. Yeah. Really I don't think she knows how to work. Yeah, you know what I mean? And they're usually my most hated people, you know? And, and I say most hated people in terms of just in the ring, not personally, just, you know, not everyone can yeah. be the wrestling fans that we were. You know what I mean? I understand that. And, you yeah. know, Goldberg made a career yeah. out of it, and he certainly. I don't think she. Wrestling. I don't think she's quite worked out to how to put the jigsaw together yet. That's it. That's it. Well, give her time. Give her time for sure. Whereas I look at someone like Sasha, and you know she's a fan of the business. You know what I mean? And it's it's you know she's an Eddie Guerrero fan. That's good enough for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so I mean, she's doing well. I, I agree. Sasha's done very well over the last year. She feels a lot more comfortable now. I really enjoyed yeah. that match she had with Nia Jax. Yeah. I think it was the week before last on SmackDown, and it was just a really well put together smaller person versus bigger person match yeah and it was just pretty much perfectly assembled in my opinion i was so yeah, well done so. and nothing so. was rushed everything was just measured perfectly yeah um just so precise and no one did more than they needed to yeah you no know? and that could be a knock at that certain promotion in date that Films its TV at Daily's price, but that's you know that's a typical AEW thing, isn't it? Where they just do too much. In stark contrast, this Sasha versus Nia Jax match, it was just the right amount of content and really big time selling from Sasha. Uh, Nia not rushing anything, uh, but yeah, Sasha and Bianca. I think Bianca's got to win. She can't fall at the final hurdle. 
Uh, but I'm, I'm, I've said this many times. I'm that she's ready for this position, but I think they've got to give her the chance to become champion. And I think Bailey will be the person that she's pitted against after she finishes the Sasha feud. Mm -hmm. And I think Bailey will be the perfect opponent for her. Yeah. As champion, you know, to me, to get that, if, if she's going to make it, she's going to make it with Sasha and Bailey as opponents. And if she doesn't make it with those two as opponents, she isn't going to make it. No, 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 I'd agree with that. I would agree with that. That's that's kind of the benchmark. Um, yeah. So elsewhere at Standard Liver, we've got MSK versus Grizzled Young Veterans versus Legado del Fantasma for the vacant NXT Tag Team Championship. Shame about Danny Birch suffering that shoulder injury. Did you see yeah, that was suplex yeah, spot against yeah. Karen Cross? Yeah. You know, Wade Barrett spotted it straight away and he was like, wow, what a horrible landing that was. Yeah, you know, yeah. Danny Birch is like, I think he's quite late 30s now done really well for himself, you know, toiled in obscurity for so long. I thought it was really improved so much as a performer. I, I really like his team with Only Larkin. I mean, I hope NXT is going to stand by him and give him a chance when he's recovered. Yeah, me too. Me too. You know, but this should be a hell of a match. MSK, obviously, they won the uh, Dusty Cup. Uh, Grizzled Young Veterans, they lost in the final. I, I'm, I'm going with GYV. I think Grizzled Young, vet, Young Veterans is going to win Me this. too. Me too. I mean, they so. deserve... The big win, you yeah. know, they've I think they've been losing finalists in the Dusty Cup the last two years. Yeah, so I think, I think it's, this it's is their time. Yeah. This is their time. I'd agree. Know. I'd agree. So and that but that should be a hell of a match. I That's mean it's gonna be interesting, yeah. For sure. Yeah. We've got a gauntlet eliminator to determine the number one contender for the NXT North American Championship on night two. Loads of people now we can't really talk about that. I will just say though that I thought it was outrageous that LA Knight did the job to Bronson Reed in his second match in the company. I can't, could not make any sense out hey, of that at all. Triple H is the savior of pro wrestling. What I are you mean, questioning? I mean, it was a clean job. I mean, you put this guy over as this next big thing, and I, I'm a huge fan of Eli Drake, LA Knight. I think he's, yeah, I think he's just... I think he's just got everything. He's, he's money. Me. He's money. He's, he's got yeah. the look. You know what? Sometimes he actually reminds me. I don't know whether this. Uh, I don't know whether you would agree with this, but at times when I was watching him in the ring in um, in NWA Power, he almost has a dynamite kid because he obviously he's a little bit taller. But you know the way the when the cameras were a little bit lower in yeah. in, in the ring, it kind of makes you look a little bit shorter sometimes. Yeah, he had. I noticed certain one thing when you've wrestled, you notice how wrestlers move. You know a certain movement that they have, and I noticed yeah. that with, uh, with 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 Eli Drake that he moved. He kind of reminded me of Dynamo Kid in certain senses, just in how he presented himself in the ring. He had a kind of a stature. He kind of held himself in a certain way where he looks like he's a tough guy, and even though he's got a melt, he can back it up. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Just just little never things. really thought. Never really thought about that, but now you mentioned. Yeah, I do get it. And yeah. um yeah, he does he moves like he moves and and his his whole demeanor and everything is like he owns the place. Yes, you know, and exactly. that's when you exude confidence. And that's and he's what a I charismatic mean. guy. You yeah. exude, you are oozing it, you know, you are there, you are owning it. Yeah. You know, and Dynamite Kid did that as well. Yeah. You know, looked at him, even when he was a baby face, he had this sort of you know you look thought god this guy's a formidable looking guy when he was really turning it up as a heel you're like yeah. mm, i wouldn't like i wouldn't like to get on the wrong side of it exactly you know <laughs> so, it's the physique and kind of but, uh, yeah i mean I, I, yeah i mean it's not over for la now it's just one loss and i'm sure no. long term it's main roster that's where he's that's where he's going to make the money and he will and, and the he thing will is get if there. vince he likes him and likes his if Vince likes him, and I think he will, as long as Vince likes his interview style, he's going to be all right. Now, if Vince changes that, he's in trouble because that will really shake his confidence. And he'll be thinking, well, yes. hold on a minute. You've hired me. You know what I can do. You're bringing me in, and now you're changing it. And obviously, we've seen WWE, stroke WWF, do this numerous times, probably <laughs> countless times, with so many talents. And you sit there and you think, well, why have you just done that? You knew what you were, you know, you knew what you were buying. How you know, dare you? How dare you all. question Vince Finn? How dare you in your in your thirty years uh, commenting on this business question, Vinnie Mac? <laughs> you know what? 
you know what? I bet Vince would admit it if you were to have that conversation with him. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know whether he would anymore, but for once upon a time he would have done, you know, when he still had that, you know, some humility left and some self-awareness. I don't know how much of that is left now. So uh, He sold anyway, himself to the Saudis, so I doubt it. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. Uh, main, I'm not sure if this is the main event. Presumably this will be the main event. Walter, NXT UK champion versus Tommaso Champa. Should be a big match. Should be hard hitting. That is going to be hard hitting. I'm sure... Walter is going to be told, though, to kind of ease up on certain things because we know Tommaso's kind of injury uh, background as well, the fact that he's a little bit older as well. Um, do you know, that's, that's the first thing I think. I'm like, Jesus, go easy on the boy. <laughs> Sometimes, you know. Uh, but, but, you know, I mean, Walter's held the title, title now for, is it best part, two years? Something yeah. like, something like, or is it over two years? It's a very long time, isn't yeah. it? And... Um, is it, and Champa hasn't really done that much lately. No. He's done a lot of jobs. And you think, is it time for the title to change hands? Well, dude, I mean, you, know, you know what it is, though, don't you? With these kind of pay-per-views, whatnot, they're generally, it's time that someone drops the belt and then they move up to the main roster, which is what we're going to talk about after this. So we yeah. can segue the two of them into it. So I, I'm kind of with you on that. I think, I think they may give it to Champa just to give him a bit of a, you know, I know it's NXT UK, but yeah, I, I, I think that's an interesting one. That's a very well, interesting I, one. I mean, we'll say, I mean, Champa has said, I think he has expressed reluctance to go to the main roster. Um, yeah. I know he did, he, well, I know he had a very brief uh, trip there, didn't he? And, and was it beginning of last year, was it? Or was it the year before? Yeah. yeah uh, was, it, was it? Yeah. Well, he had a very brief stay there. He doesn't he? like the schedule, yeah. Yeah, he doesn't like the schedule. As for Walter, after his experience in that Survivor Series match, remember when he did the job to Drew in like less than two minutes? Uh, I'm not sure if I fancy his chances on the main roster, so I don't know whether that's going to go. Yeah, that and it's no, it's no offence to Walter because he's a good guy. Um, I think it's more due to the fact that Vince will be like, he's, we got to change his look, you know? Yeah. we gotta, we got to put some of that meat in place. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know... I would, like those I big, well, like I, I, I was asked this question on a podcast recently, and they were like, if Walter is standing side by side with Drew Galloway, yeah, they're both pretty much the same height. In fact, Drew is probably taller. Drew is probably equally as wide side by side as as Walter is, but yeah. one one is cut from fucking granite, and the other. It's just a ball of mass. And I mean that yeah. in the nicest way. Yeah. So, like, how do you... I mean, the only way they used to sell Yoko Zuna was because, yes, he was a big man, but he was also fucking 500 pounds. Walter isn't. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, I don't really see the place for Walter yet. No. I I mean, I wouldn't fancy his chances on, in Vince McMahon's... Me neither. Me neither. And I'm sure he's smart enough to know that he probably would not excel there. Although he has stated uh, an interest in having a match with Brock Lesnar. And I think that would be blockbuster. I think that would be huge. It would be a blockbuster, but at the same time, I mean, who looks the most impressive? And who looks like he's going to get his ass yeah. kicked? Again, Brock yeah. is twice, probably twice the width of him, you know? I think... Yeah. Um, I think Walter has to make some, if he wants to get to that top roster and be like one of the main guys, I think he's got to make some decisions, much like Drew did back in the day in terms yeah. of what he wants to do with his physique, you know? Yeah. Does he want to put more yeah. mass on? That's okay, holding that little bit of extra weight, but he's got to be more impressive around here, around here, around here, around, you know, around the main parts of the, you understand what I'm saying, because I'm just talking about what Vince wants. He's got to get, there's only one person he needs to get over with. And he's got the initials BKM. Yep. And we know what Vince likes. Yeah. And look at, you know, we've got, look at Bobby Lashley. Would he be champion right now if he didn't look like that? No, no. chance. No. Nope. No way. No. Nope. So, I mean, you know, look at the top guys. I mean, I know Daniel Bryan's kind of a wild guy. He's an exception. You know, he's a maverick type guy. But, I mean, Daniel Bryan's come along like, Mick Foley and Cactus Jack and Mankind. He did very well in the system in the late 90s, early 2000s. But very few people who look like Mick Foley would do well in that system. 
he was a one-off he was an exception to the rule and you're right about Walter and you know I'm a fan of his I think he's a tremendous performer me too yeah, yeah and that match he had with Pete Dunne is one of my favorite matches the last few years I just thought that was just am amaze balls I don't use that word very often Ian <laughs> I mean it was absolutely tremendous I really uh, enjoyed his match with Dragunov on NXT UK that was outstanding as well really put that over in Inside the Ups uh, magazine I remember did that interview with uh, Jim Cornette we actually did a huge uh, we did a fairly large section just on that match yeah, alone yeah, yeah, yeah. in that interview with Cornette um, but yeah we, we know what Vince wants from his talent and we, you know, he's got certain expectations. And I'm sure Walter's smart enough to know that if he was to go to the main roster, it could be rocky to say the least. Anyway, let's move to night two, which you will be on the WWE Network. Yeah, let's I mean, get on to let's get on to the main matches on this one. And who yes. we, what what we think could affect the, the I suppose the program in the months to follow. Yeah. Are we talking about night two of Stand and Deliver now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, with Finn Balor versus Karrion Cross, I would think fit, this is what I think. I think Finn's retaining, and I think this, this is Karrion Cross and Scarlett's swan song, and I think they're going to the main roster after that. That's what I think. So do you not think that um, with the whole feud, with, with the fact that, you know, they're going to get Finn and Adam Cole and all that kind of stuff going to the roster, do you not think that Finn is one of the, one of the shouts to go up? Well, maybe so, maybe later in the year. But to me, carrying Cross, isn't, it hasn't really worked in NXT for me. It just mm. hasn't. Yeah. I just don't think he's really up to the standard that they expect in the ring. But on the main roster, I think the entrance, Scarlet, the character, the promos, I think it can work on the main roster. I think he's more compatible with Raw or SmackDown than he really is with NXT. I know that, that makes 100% sense because I actually had a conversation with a lot of people and they were kind of, they were asking me, Have you, has Finn talked to you? Is he going up to the main roster? Or I said, well, I don't know. And even if even if he was going to talk to somebody, he's not going to tell me. And even if I did know, I'm not going to tell you. Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, think, I think the writing is on the wall that Finn is going to go back to the main roster at some point. Um, I, I think he will as well. I think I'm Vince, confident. because I think Vince did have a thing for Finn. And I think now that that, it's like the Drew Galloway situation. He's went yeah. back. He's never had to be fired from the company. He's shown that he can carry a company on his shoulders as the main guy. He's shown that he, like his promos have improved tenfold. I think we, I think we'd all agree with that. Yes. And I think he's shown that he doesn't need to be the demon anymore. You know what I mean? But Vince yeah. always has that in reserve that if he needs a demon, you know, to 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 come out and make an appearance, that he has that. And also he knows that how much value that is for merchandise. Um, because at the end of the day, it's all about money with Vince. Let's be real. Um I do oh, absolutely. Yeah, you're you're right. I mean, the thing about it is Bala with this character, you can see that he it's very different to anything that he's done before and it yeah. stands out. It's he exceptional. He obviously was exceptional in the ring, but the character was not to the same standard. And he's obviously recognized that and he has changed things. And the demon was kind of in a set, kind of a shortcut, wasn't it? As a character. It masked, it masked her. That. It was like, yeah. you know. Yeah. And it was not really filling that hole in his repertoire. And he's done that now in NXT with this character that he's playing there. Uh, interestingly, in the late, have you seen the latest issue of Inside the Ropes magazine yet? I haven't yeah. yet, but I, I, I do have it. I just haven't read it. All right. Well, interestingly, you asked me a question in Q and A about Finn Balor, which I answered. <laughs> so, yes. But you gave me your answer it. also privately. So, fairness. I, I, right. I, I, okay. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. But I mean, to me. Yeah, I think he can go there. I mean, I don't know whether it feels like he's done everything that, to me, it doesn't seem like it's time for Karrion Cross to defeat Finn Balor for the NXT title. I feel like Cross is on his way out. That's my okay. uh, feeling. That's, That's my instinct here. That okay. this, that his run there is coming to an end. It doesn't feel to me like Finn Balor's is. Maybe it's a could be wrong, be wrong many times before. But I think if Finn returns against Karrion Cross. There are many more matches he can have. If 
Karrion Cross regains the belt, who's he going to wrestle next? I can't think of too many matches that I'm that excited about seeing him have in NXT. Are you, can you think of any opponents no, who would like no, to see no, him no, the belt that makes, that makes sense. And to be honest with you, I think you could probably see that later in the year because I think the Adam Cole, Finn Balor feud has got to come to a big head. And I think that's exactly when we always seen those big feuds come to a head. It's like the Balor Kevin Owens one before he went up. Yeah. Um, I think you're probably onto something there, but I do think it will happen. So carrying cross is a good show. And let's, I suppose, let's segue. Let's, that's a good way of segueing into like who we think comes up. Because, I mean, carrying cross, you seem to be have a, an inkling that carrying cross is coming up. Who else do you think is going to come up? Uh, I don't know, really. I mean, Adam Cole, it's got to be time for him as well. Because we know they've got this big match coming up with Kyle O'Reilly, the unsanctioned match. Uh, and that, to me, Kyle has to win this match. What do you think? All right, and I suppose I am biased. All right, <laughs> I'm talking about my coach here, Finn Balor, okay? What does Adam Cole offer to the organisation that Finn doesn't? Well, I mean, I'm not convinced that Adam Cole can make it on the main roster. Exactly, because I think he looks weaker than Finn. Because yes. Finn, like, they're both similar height, probably the exact same height, but Finn actually looks like Jim Cornette said it as well. Finn looks like a fucking dynamite kid without the bullshit. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's that's his words, not mine. But yeah. Finn looks like someone that you can still market because the one thing that Finn has is that he's so chiseled. Yes. And his work rate is just phenomenal. So when Finn stands beside some, even when Stan, Finn used to stand side by side by Seth Rollins, it didn't look like there was a huge size difference. You know no. what I mean? So, like, I'm looking at that and I'm going, right, if you're going to, and I know a lot of people have said to me, and you can probably, you can probably chime in on this, uh, Finn, <laughs> two Finns. <laughs> um, like, realistically, it's not, uh, you know, some people have said to me, oh, I think Fergal is happy there. I think he's happy down in NXT. And I would agree. But he's also a professional. If he gets the call from the old man yeah, to go up to the top, he's not going to turn around and say no. No. Because he knows, you know, and look, you, you've had a relationship with Fergal as well. You know how ambitious that, that guy is. Sure. He, is, he knows he has unfinished business there, especially with that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so. absolutely. And the thing is, he, you're right, he does. He absolutely does. And, you know, with this new character uh, in his favour, he's going to go up there and he's going to do those things that they probably said in meetings he couldn't do. Yeah. And, like, there was obviously reasons why Vince didn't go all the way with him. Okay, he was first Universal Champion. Then he came back. I mean, the big match, of course, that we all remember was the match we brought Lesnar. Oh, that was Where, and Brock done a Brock done a great job for Finn there on that match. Anybody that hasn't seen that, go back and watch him with Brock sells for for Finn on that one. You know, with the whole they sold the story with the with the the ribs, and the gut. Yeah, Brock doesn't Absolutely. do that for many people. He doesn't, and there obviously there's a size difference there between them. But Lesnar, I mean, he's all business. He's the ultimate pro. He'll go in there and he'll work with anyone. He'll do yeah. whatever they say as long as they pay him. Yeah. And he was not deterred at all by the size difference or yeah. showing any reluctance at all to put this or make this guy look like he's equal before, of course, he defeated him in the end. But there was that famous promo where Finn's in the ring and Vince is there. And Finn says, well, you know, Vince, you've never, you know, the fans be believe in me, but you don't. And that was that famous promo. And you're like, well, that's definitely, you know, art imitating life or life imitating art. He's like, we know there was some truth to that. Yeah. Is that Vince, and we know because he didn't defeat Brock. And to me, that would have been a real leg up, a huge boost for Virgil's yeah. character. Had he beaten Lesnar and then dropped the belt three weeks later, the next or four weeks later, the next pay-per-view, that he would have been made. That would have been a huge status enhancer. He would be massively enriched by that victory. And instead, he lost to Lesnar and was out of the race. And, um, I mean, that must have been very dispiriting for him. He must have been very demoralised, knowing that he came close but didn't make it. So if he's going back, and we're both in agreement that he is, 
Uh, I'm not saying it's going back the week after WrestleMania. No, I agree. I agree. I, agree. I think there's still some mountains from you, decline. You've sold like, me. You've sold me on that. Like, here's a scenario. I mean, I, I, like, it's just a scenario. Me and you have, yourself and myself, sorry, that, that's, that's better English, <laughs> me and you. <laughs> yourself and myself have made um, kind of many claims on how this works. I mean, it's when you look at some of his best work when it was in New Japan with the Bullet Club and he had a gang behind him. You bring that yeah. guy in as a heel, as the Melt uh, Heart Foundation 1997 is a perfect example. Yeah, the Melt, and you have guys like you could even have AJ Styles and all involved in this, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, where it eventually leads to a feud between those two guys because I mean. A yeah. WrestleMania match without any title involved with AJ Styles and Finn Balor needs to happen. I've always thought this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Yeah, and it, you know, the great irony was, um, I think, wasn't AJ's first night Fergal's last in New Japan? Yes. Yeah. I think that's right, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and then they they had that famous match. Then I think was it at a SummerSlam or? Yeah, the, was it was that the one when Roman Reigns and Bray were? They were both, they had some illness, didn't they? I forget yes, what it was. Yes, yes, yes. And they needed like an emergency replacement. Yeah. And I think, yeah, was, I can't remember who, was it AJ oh. moving over to, I can't remember who, how it all fell up, how it all came about, but it was a last minute, someone was a last minute replacement for someone who was. But, he, but, um, but the old man, the old man puffed Finn Balor over. And this is what I tried to remind people. This was at a time where AJ was red hot. I mean, white hot. And they still mm. put Finn Balor over and nobody expected it. So, I mean, the old man definitely, definitely has something for him. It's just, and I think you're onto something there, Finley, that uh, I think it's those little probably things that he needed to iron out, the promo, yeah. the skills, the, you know, can I, can I trust this guy to be a heel if yeah. we decide to go that route? Can I trust yeah. him to, be, you know what I mean? Do I just... Yeah, I mean, he was kind of a bit of a... Kind of in a, a bit of a smiley baby face, oh, room, wasn't it? Yeah, like and it, yeah, I hate that kind of thing. You know, what I mean? you know I'm, sure, I'm sure he did too. Yeah, you oh. doomed. You were just doomed when you were seen as a smiley baby face. Well, look, you've you uh, talked to the man many a times, and you know his passion for wrestling. You know he would much prefer to be the bad guy and being, you know, or or somewhere in between. You know what I mean? I think he's. Yeah. Uh, I think Finn definitely the way he's worked on his promos very much so has the capability of coming back in that kind of CM Punk anti-hero role. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. I mean, it's it's something that can definitely work, and I'm sure the the reason that I don't think he's going now is that it doesn't feel like this match with Karrion Cross has been really built up properly. Sure, sure. And and I feel that when he's ready, he, he should what he should do is he should drop the title to whomever it is that they're going to make champion for the next three, six, nine months or whatever, and then leave the next week. And that should just be it. And that should be his going away present to whomever's going to replace it. I, I can't see that. Karrion Cross becoming the next NXT champ. I just can't yeah. see it. And I've always felt that the Karrion Cross and Scala act with their entrance, this was tailor-made for Vince McMahon. Mm. It was like this was created for Vince McMahon's benefit so that he would say, Yes, I want those two next. Yeah, um, no, that makes sense. You know, and I think Scarlett is somebody who um, is very different to every other woman in that entire WWE system. Obviously very attractive, but she's got um, a lot of talent as well. She can take a bump. She can do a basic match fairly well. Um, and she's got, um, I would almost call it like a femme fatale type character. Yes, yes, uh, yes. You know who the sort of person who would lead men astray? Like I, I don't know if you're a film noir fan, like but a, like it's a spirit, like a like a like a black, like the Medusa. Black, like, like yeah, Medusa. the classic Black Widow. And oh, um, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, there so you go. I think those two, as an act, are going to fare better on the main roster. And for me, Finn needs to stick around for maybe three, four months. Maybe coming after SummerSlam, I don't know, sometime in the summer anyway. After he's dropped the title to whomever. He's going to replace him. Yeah, you know what? Well, I mean, going back to what you're saying about Adam Cole, you know, he's facing Kyle O'Reilly. Now, it feel, in the unsanctioned match, now, this is going to be a tough match. We know it should really sizzle. And Kyle's, got to, Kyle's got to go over. He has to, because it feels like Adam Cole's at the end of his run in NXT. He's never going to hold the main title again. Uh, the Undisputed Era, obviously, over. 
he's wrestled basically everyone. But you're right, can Cole make it on the main roster? Does he have... I mean, he's, he does a lot of things very well. I believe so, but, yeah, yeah. But I'm not convinced that Vince would see star in him. And you've already said that. Yeah. You know, Finn, because he's ripped and everything, you can understand why Vince would see... And obviously, he's had the first runs. So Canon knows who he is. He'll have seen some of his NXT stuff. Probably he's not. A, he's, a, he's a good-looking guy as well, Finn. You know, you can market the face and the body. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's it's gonna. And don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say that you know Adam Cole isn't. It's just he's a different look. You know what I yeah. mean? Um, yeah. I'm I'm having a hard time finding a like a key spot for him on Raw or SmackDown. Yeah. I just can't see him in any of those. I can't see him going in there and and beating major players but at the same time his NXT run is over it's three and a half years or thereabouts that he's been there and it's just time for him to move on well look he's got to be given a chance anyway you know what I mean if they have I mean that's up to that's up to those guys as well like at the end of the day he's a body in there he he's got to go in and try to um action whatever you know role that they give him you know what I mean so with the yeah moment, and like that, that, that's going to be on them and on him. You know what I mean? Like if they give him the role that he has now, what can he be? I don't see him as a CM Punk type character. Um, you know, I don't see Adam Cole, Bebe getting over because it's just, just it's basically just a tagline. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't like he does like. I mean, he had that run with uh, what was the NFL player? God damn it. He's Pat McAfee, probably the best non pro wrestler to come into the business in the last few years that gets the business probably more than pro wrestlers, to be fair. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, 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 yeah really good. He's tremendous. Love that guy. I watch his podcasts and everything now. And he's just, he's just, a, he just seems a really intelligent young guy. Like, you know what I mean? Um, so I don't know whether he's going to get the call up because of the rub that he had with that situation and bringing eyes to NXT and stuff like that. But I mean, yeah, I find it kind of... But hopefully he proves us wrong, you know? Hopefully. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I you know, I want everyone to get over. I want everyone Me to too. well. Me too. Know? I'm always a because, champion of the underdog, you know? And you know, the, bi the business becomes stronger as a result and the more entertaining it is, the more people who want to watch it. Do uh, know. Uh, everyone get paid. Always. You know, or tell it, you know, or recommend it to the friends, and then they might become fans. So, yeah. you know, I, I'm I'm not I'm not discounting Adam Cole's talents because I think he's really good. Me too. I'm just trying to see a place for him in that company. So that, that's yeah. exactly what it is. But look, I think we've come to the end of our uh, end of our discussion tonight, and it's been once again for our first one of 2021. I think it's been pretty awesome. Um, well, hopefully, people have enjoyed it. I don't think it's our place to review our own performance, Ian. Mm. <laughs> we'll leave that to Tony Khan. I'll give you a 10 and me uh, me six. I don't know how many stars Dave Meltzer will give me on this one, but, you know, when he, you know, I'll, I'll reserve all of his stars for Kenny Omega. How was that? Let Dave keep all of his stars. Okay, do that. Yeah. And you know, the one man, yeah. as we end this podcast, the one man that doesn't have a move named after him is yours truly, Finley Martin. And you know what? Someone needs to well, make the, a Martin driver. That's what I think. Yeah, that sounds like. You know what? I, you know what? I'm just happy doing what I'm doing. Thank you. And uh, people can name the moves after other people as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, but hey, great speaking to you again, Ian. And uh, the only other couple of things I'm going to say about um, Sam Deliver with Johnny Gargano's facing the Gauntlet Eliminator match winner johnny's to me nxt for life doing really well there don't want to see him on the main roster the other one was devlin versus santos escobar in a ladder match for to determine who's the undisputed or rightful nxt champ so that's a big match for both there isn't it really yeah so, i'm looking uh, forward to seeing my uh, my good brother jordan devlin shouting out to uh, jordan devlin I, I keep in regular contact with that boy so uh, i'm definitely going to be uh, watching to see how he does uh, he's in good spirits back back in uh, back in form now and uh, yeah. that's going to be that's 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 a show that's a quiet match that could actually be better than a lot of yeah. people expect i think 
How did he go about getting into the States? Was that difficult for him to get to be able to travel there? Did you do you know the details of that? Can you share the details of that? I haven't asked that question, believe it or not. I would I'm not saying that I wouldn't share it. Well, being honest with you, I probably wouldn't share the details okay. if I did know. All right. Well, <laughs> I, I, well, I well, know for, for instance, Pac was unable to travel um to America for AEW for many, many months. And obviously they got him in. And I know for work purposes, they, they can for essential work purposes, you can go abroad. So I'm sure I'm sure that you know that was it, that was WWE. How it, I'm sure WWE called uh, the Irish T shock and said, look, fuck you, we're getting it in. <laughs> 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 we don't really care what you think. <laughs> we're, we're getting them in. That was probably that was Probably how the conversation played out, you know, word let's, for word. Let's be real, to be fair. Um, I think, um, no, and, and by the way, that, that's a good point you made. Wouldn't Pac wish he was in WWE again? Just saying. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, let's face it, he didn't have a good experience there. And he ended up basically quitting. Was it about nine or ten months before his contract expired? It was something crazy, wasn't it? Do you remember that? I'd love, I'd love to see him back anywhere other than WWE. So in closing, I suppose, if we're talking about AEW, um, not, still not the still not where it needs to be, in my opinion. Um, I, still yeah. think, I still think Tony Khan needs to look personally at getting someone in as a booker, much similar to, um, to how WCW used to have Kevin Sullivan as a booker. You know what I mean? Yeah. Someone, someone that has nothing to gain or nothing to lose so that he can book the, the, the matches that are on the lower card and kind of give some, I suppose, uh, some narrative to the matches as well and start yeah. getting guys and girls over. I don't think any young stars are being made from this because the matches, I don't know how you feel about them, but I think they just seem to be a bit of a cluster at the moment, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're definitely doing too much in matches. Yes. You know, I mean, there's just like so many needless false finishes, often in open, opening matches. I mean, I will give them credit for one thing. They have reduced the time of some, ma some matches for a while. Almost every match on Dynamite went like 10 minutes. And they have now started booking shorter matches when it's needed. So they have taken that one on board. Well, who's getting match. over in these matches, though? That's well, the problem. That is obviously an excellent point. <laughs> No, no one really is getting over in these matches, <laughs> you're right. But there, there does need to be more of a sort of experienced wrestling brain backstage. And, it, you know, it's a shame because there's already so many very experienced wrestling minds backstage now who he's Let's, obviously not listening to. You know? Tully Blanchard, Aaron Anderson. Um, I think Ricky Steamboat was there now as well. Dean I mean, Jerry, We know Jerry Lynn's there. I mean, Jerry Lynn. You know, Jerry Lynn is... The guy I interviewed numerous times, and Geraldine was a guy who was a proponent for selling. Guys need to do less and sell more. Jake the uh, Snake is there. Jake you know the what I mean? There. I mean, my God, the guy, the psychology master who could get so much out of almost nothing. And I just think they just really need to just reduce the amount of moves they do so that all of them mean more. What do you I think? I think so. I think so. I think what you're saying, and, and I think we, we should close with this because I think realistically a lot of these old guys are coming in and they're getting paid and really and it looks like they don't really care anymore at this yeah. stage it looks like they're fighting a lost cause there's no management structure there there's no leader tony yeah. khan is meant to be the leader but i think tony khan is a fanboy no disrespect but i think he's being a fanboy um and you understand what i mean by that like he's he's a mark and he's happy to be there and look He's got the greatest intentions to try and make a wrestling product, yeah. you know, accessible to everyone, but it doesn't seem like he's trying to make it accessible to everyone. Like, no. he's made it accessible to everyone, but it doesn't feel like his yeah. intention is to get everybody in on it. It's yeah. kind of like, you know, that group over in the corner that's like, hey, come join us, but yeah, we're going to nudge you out if you don't, you know, if you don't know what we're talking about, then... You know, you, we're not, gonna, you, you're gonna we're gonna lose. You're gonna get lost. You're not gonna yeah, know what's so, going on. And I think Tony Khan gonna... is the biggest problem, in the sense that he's got he's got money to burn. We know that, um, but I think because he's such a fan, he's basically been influenced by some of these guys. Yeah. Um, to just let them do whatever the hell they want basically yeah it does at times it does feel really self-indulgent and yeah. you know occasionally you'll have matches where they're doing like 
you know, a Canadian destroyer followed by like a cutter and then the guy's kicking out and this is the only match. And you're like, you don't need to be doing these this many moves in the opening match. No. And you're just really prostituting the moves and you're diminishing the value of these moves by having guys kick out of them. It's not drama. It's not, it's not, it's not exciting. It's just not theater, you become yeah. numb to it. You become yeah. numb to all the moves and nothing means anything. And it's just like, well, just tone things down, do less. And then everything will mean more. I'll give you a Less good example. So give you a good example, right? Yeah. In closing, football, soccer is the biggest, probably one of the biggest sports in the world, biggest team sports in the world. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now we watch players play with certain tactics to try and, you know, get a goal. Because what's the goal in the end? To get a goal and your team wins. Yeah. Now, who is going to pay for 90 minutes to watch a Samba street soccer player do tricks? Okay, it looks pretty cool for the first minute, yeah? yeah? Sure. But then afterwards, it loses its value, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's just yeah. It's the way I look at it. Yeah. yeah, well, hopefully, when I return in two or three months' time, you know, they will have made these adjustments that we've recommended. I mean, they probably won't have done, but, you know, we can always hope. Well, I have faith. I have faith. Tony Khan, if you're out there listening... I'm sorry for the f- previous things I've said about you. Come on the show and tell me why I'm wrong. Call me an asshole if you want. Come on the show, tell me why I'm wrong and why the project long term is going to be exactly where we want it. Because believe it or not, people like myself and Finn are rooting for you. Yeah. And the boys yeah. and the girls. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. So absolutely, I yeah. think that's a great way of closing. I think it's a positive note. Let's all still believe in the believe in the process, as they always say in team sports. Yeah, and, uh, and, yeah. and let's not forget, they're still only two years old. I know I said that last year that they were only one year old, but I'm going to give them till they're four years old. And then it's like you're on your own, kid. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, <laughs> so, yeah, look, it's been a, been a pleasure, Finn. I think, um, I think we covered everything we wanted to cover this week. And hopefully Pretty we much. will see you here in another three months as well, our usual quarterly uh, catch up. Fantastic. I look forward to it. I'm sure, well, well, obviously lots more will have happened by then. And maybe we'll have our freedom, Ian. We you will know? have our freedom. And finally, we will get to have that nice point of bitter over in uh, your neck of the woods. Yeah, looking forward to it. Looking Absolutely. forward to it. I can't wait. So, yeah, we'll speak, yeah we'll speak in a few months. See you then. Thank you, sir. Bye.